on this edition of Impact, a special documentary feature. She was just crying, and, and I'm like, Angelica, you know, what, what's, what's wrong? And she's like, come home now, you need to come home now. And I said, what, what is it? Is he okay? Is he okay? And she's like, I don't know, they're in there with him now. And I, I'm like, is he dead? And she's like, I, I think so, I don't know. And we just cried, <laughs> we cried all night. We have to get the things to put the thing in the ground, and I don't know where you get those. I knew then that, that I was going to marry him. I didn't know. We hadn't talked about marriage yet, but I just knew in my heart that I wanted to marry him. It's like, well, we could go to Vegas and get married. <laughs> I said, well, I know I would marry you, but I know my family would disown me, you know, if I ran off to Vegas and eloped. And he's like, really? You would marry me? And I'm like, of course. It was like the most sure decision I've ever made in my entire life. I loved his friends and I loved his kids and I just, it seemed like it was a really good foundation. On May 11th, 2005, that foundation shattered when Sergeant Ananda McClure killed himself in the apartment where he and Laura Hansen started a life together. I just, I just screamed and cried like uncontrollably. Ananda had only been back seven months from Iraq when he shot himself. That gunshot is still ringing for Laura and Ananda's loved ones. It wasn't all that long ago when he entered Laura's life. We got introduced and we just started talking. He always said he knew the minute I walked through the door before, you know, we even spoke that it was like, whoa. Um, it was definitely love at first sight for him. I mean, I think the longest we were ever apart was 24 hours. We decided to move in together. It was surprisingly easy. He was very neat. He loved to do the laundry. He cooked. Um, so he, on numerous occasions, brought me breakfast in bed, which was awesome. I'd never had that before. And he was very domestic. You know, he got up earlier than me. Once um, he was awake, he'd bring Emma in to, to cuddle with me while he read the morning paper and played video games. <laughs> They'd only known each other for less than a month. But Laura knew something was special about Ananda. On January 13th, which was my mother's 60th birthday, he came with me to her birthday party. We hadn't talked about marriage yet, but I just knew in my heart that I wanted to marry him. And, and I told my mom that night in the bathroom at Cafe Bijou in Santa Monica, I'm like, he's the one. Less than a month later, they had a small wedding ceremony on the beach in Malibu and were planning a larger reception for their friends and family. This was his ring and then he gave me this Tiffany bean necklace for my birthday, which I wear quite a bit. And then these earrings here were the ones that I bought in Paris that I was gonna wear for our bigger wedding. Between these two ceremonies, Ananda underwent back surgery. A few weeks into his recovery, Laura and her mother took a trip to Paris they had postponed because of Ananda's surgery. Ananda dropped the two of them off at the airport. So Ananda comes and picks me up on that Monday morning and He's in great spirits. I put my suitcase in the trunk, and off we go down the freeway to pick up Laura, who was still packing. Well, we got off on Sepulveda because the freeway was really crowded, and we were driving by the Veterans Cemetery, and Ananda expressed how much he loved that cemetery, and that uh, he had such peace there, and that 
when he would have a lunch break, he would sometimes go over there and walk through the cemetery just by himself. He then talked also about how much he loved his children and he loved Laura and that he would always provide. That was sort of our conversation as we drove down the freeway. We, you know, dropped us off at the airport and hugged and kissed goodbye. While Laura was gone, Angelica Galvez was the only one ever in the apartment other than Ananda. Galvez and Laura are co-workers and friends. They worked on architectural and design projects out of the office in Laura and Ananda's apartment. He kept telling me that he uh, was feeling bad. He had all this ringing on his ear and pressure on his head. And, and I, uh, I, told, I, I told him I was going to take him to the emergency room. And then he said that, that he was, that he was going to see the doctor the next day. On Thursday, May 12th, Galvez was over at the apartment at around 6.30 p.m. She went to the door of the bedroom to check on Ananda. She saw him lying in the bed. Because I thought that he might be taking a nap, and I didn't want, you know, I just, I was quiet. Friday, Paris time, Laura and her mother still hadn't heard from him. I was um, going to play tennis with my friend. Uh, I was on my way to meet him to play tennis, and um, Laura called me from Paris. And I said, Angelica, you know, I'm, I'm kind of worried. I haven't heard from Ananda now in two days. I've left a bunch of messages. Um, do you mind going to the apartment and checking, seeing if his car is there? Ananda's car was there. I looked in the bedroom, and I saw him sleeping. I thought like, he probably was dead. So I just walked outside and called my friend. And he's the one who went inside. And when he came outside, he told me that he thought that he was dead. I just don't know. I felt so weak and I to, to start crying. She was just crying and, and I'm like, Angelica, you know, what, what's, what's wrong? And she's like, come home now, you need to come home now. And I said, what, what is it? Is he okay? Is he okay? And she's like, I don't know, they're in there with him now. And I, I'm like, is he dead? And she's like, I, I think so, I don't know. And we just cried, <laughs> we cried all night. Laura and her mother caught the first flight home to Los Angeles. And uh, we went straight to the apartment because I wanted to come here and, um, and just see it. He was in bed when he shot himself under the covers and the bullet actually entered right over here. I had to pry it out of there, but this, it was basically wedged, wedged in there. After Laura went to her apartment, she went to see Anana's ex-wife, Marie Shrillo, and their two children. We went to see um, Christopher and Melissa and their mom. And they were so strong. Christopher was worried about me and how I was doing. And he's only, he was only 12 at the time. And he's like, Laura, are you OK? And I just couldn't believe this little boy could just be so sensitive. and. He was just trying to be so strong for everybody. And little Melissa was just, you know, crying like a little girl would, you know. The police had already notified Marie and her kids on Friday night. I picked up the phone and there was a police officer on the phone. And he just, yeah, he asked me who I was, if I was Marie, and I said yes. And then he told me what happened and I was just, I just kept saying, oh my God, you know, never, never expected that, never expected in my wildest dreams to get a phone call like that. And then all, all I could say to the um, policeman on the phone was, what do I tell my kids? What do I tell my children? And he just said, tell them the truth because they were gonna find the truth out anyway. So I did. I just told I just told him exactly what happened and we all we all sat here and cried. Um, I was just really shocked. I didn't know like what to do. I, there was lots of like crying going on and stuff, so yeah. After going through the pain of finding out about his death, they had to experience two funerals. One of those surfaces included military traditions. The other was a burial in Westwood, 
at the same cemetery Ananda had said was so peaceful. This flag Ananda received for his service in Iraq. Um, it's Service to America Global War on Terrorism flag. Warrior Citizen Award of Excellence. And then um, this flag here is the one that I was given the day of his funeral where they um, folded it in front of me after the 21 gun salute um, at the funeral home on May 20th. And that was incredibly emotional, obviously, to have everyone was standing outside as that was being done. And, uh, and then his children, the day of the graveside ceremony, also each got their own flags folded for them that day. So they did three flags. When the services ended, Ananda's loved ones had to face life without him. What happens to the people that are left behind? It's a, it's a selfish act because they don't know anything else. It's an illness. They see, they see in tunnel vision as a way to relieve their pain. Matter than hell to hurt my daughter this badly. Anger. I thought you two loved each other so intensely and you had so much to live for. And my initial reaction was anger. I couldn't help it. They had so much to live for. And at their wedding on the beach there at Paradise Cove, I never saw two happier people in my life. Those two children, they're so beautiful that he talked about so lovingly. I was angry. I remember just grabbing some pillows and just taking these pillows. The kids were asleep and I just took these pillows and smashed them right here on the, on the couch and I was just yelling, how could you do this, Andy? How could you, how could you leave me? How could you leave us? So, um, that's, that was the last the last big outburst, and now I'm just, uh, and I just go on day to day. Laura said she never was angry at Ananda for leaving her. She said she relied on her spirituality to get her through her grief. And I talk to him sometimes. You know, I definitely feel he's still around me. Seven months before Ananda committed suicide, he had served in his third tour of duty in Iraq. He was stationed in Mosul, where he specialized in disposing of dangerous weapons. Shortly after Ananda's last tour, Wendell Guillermo also served in Mosul, a place he says was always dangerous. There's a lot of things going on there. It's the hornet's, hornet's nest, so to speak. It's a lot of action. All wars are loaded with action, and when soldiers return, they need a place to go in order to deal with what they experienced. One veteran created such a place for returning soldiers, the National Veterans Foundation. The NVF's mission is to provide crisis management for veterans and their families. What was the date of your, uh, when you, you got hit? June 14th, 1969. Shad Mishad started the NVF in 1985. Mishad was an army captain in Vietnam who started a 27-year-long career working with veterans when he returned from the war. He says what's different about Iraq is that violence is all over the country. You have no safe place there, I mean, even, even more so than Vietnam. I mean, even the green zone is, is even as dangerous almost as being out, quote, in the field or in the villages because the terrorists are everywhere. One day you have a person waving to you and saying hi and you know go Americans then the next day he could he or she could be that person playing the bomb and playing to blow yourself up and your comrades up just because they know that you probably come through here like at least twice a week. Like Guillermo, Ananda volunteered to go back to Iraq for a third tour. Something Mishad says was unheard of in past wars. Now we have multiple tours in Vietnam and Korea, usually, you know, you have one tour. Imagine a person that's coming back off his fourth tour. He has a, he has a, 
a traumatic experience or multiple in each war and, and those are unresolved because he's just con he endures. That's what a soldier does. He endures. He continues on. Ananda was married to Marie during his three tours of active duty. Marie and the kids remember when Ananda had to leave for war. He really kept it to himself. He didn't like show any of his emotions, so it was hard to figure out what was sort of going on. As much as he'd talk about what he had to do or people he had to protect or people he had to kill, once he was over there and he was witnessing, you know, roadside bombs and things flying at them in, in their mess hall or, or wherever they might be, he realized, oh God, this is, this is reality. People talk in a very romantic way about wars, like it's this thing, it's like the commercials for soldiers and stuff, that it's really that way, it's the total opposite. War is bloody, gory detail, that's what it is. It is just horrific, it's man's inhumanity to man. In fact, he had photos, and he would sort of pull the photos out and talk about the photos a lot, which seems sort of strange and morbid to me. But you can tell that it really was too much for him. Ananda's pictures documented many of his experiences in Iraq, including graphic pictures of dead enemies. Guillermo stresses the importance of all memories, even those of the dead. When I went to Iraq, too, I, I took numerous pictures as well. Like some of those pictures that I've taken with uh, the guys, you know, brings back a lot of good memories. and. The time that we spent over there, just watching each other's back, I mean. And just seeing um, pictures of, um, you know, say, dead people, you know. You say, you know what, what if, what if a split second later, if I didn't know that guy had the, deton the detonator and the Humvee in front of me would have been blown up. You know, four of my friends, five of my friends would have been dead, you know. Guillermo recognizes some familiar scenes as he looks through some of Ananda's photos. And wow, right here, definitely an IED, and that's a really huge explosion. Looks like it's above the bridge, towards the uh, intersection up there. I mean, they, they would detonate those whenever a convoy, for example, like this right here in the bottom road would be coming by. Normally, they'd hit the middle vehicles. So if you're the first or last vehicle, normally you'd be okay but that's when you know you're gonna fire back. Ananda was injured in just that situation. He was escorting a convoy when a roadside bomb hit the Humvee he was driving. His spine was crushed in the explosion. When he returned home, he had to deal with that injury. On April 12th, Ananda underwent back surgery at Good Samaritan Hospital in downtown LA. Doctors had to vacuum out the broken pieces in his back going to all these doctor's appointments and trying to decide if he should have the surgery, if he should have another steroid injection, you know, that stressed him out. And I think he was really afraid about the surgery. I mean, the night before the surgery, he didn't sleep at all. Along with the pain of his injury, Ananda also suffered some of the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Shortly after Ananda's death, Kevin Herrera of the Santa Monica Daily Press wrote about PTSD treatment Ananda sought at a clinic in Westwood. Herrera reported Ananda was part of a growing number of patients seeking help for PTSD in recent years. The clinic in Westwood has seen an increase from roughly 34 patients to 800 over the past decade. Mishad, one of the pioneers in the field of PTSD, can easily recognize the symptoms. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a condition uh, that is experienced by people that suffer a catastrophic event when you pretty much think you're going to die and then you survive it. We have these multiple symptoms that occur. You can have flashbacks and all of a sudden you go into a panic attack. You become very irritable. You constantly have anger flashes. You have nightmares. You wake up over and over again. We have hypervigilance, you're always on, and so everything associated with the experience, you know, like a noise, something that cracks, a smell, uh, just anything that sets your senses that is a little bit similar 
can lock in almost just like you would lock in on a target and, and you become combat ready. He would have nightmares almost every night and talk in his sleep. He became very uh, nervous and anxious. There was one time we were walking down the street and this van backfired and he almost, you know, pulled me down to the ground thinking it was, you know, a bomb or a gunshot. Ananda was prescribed several medications to treat the physical pain of his back and his anxiety. But before Ananda experienced trauma in the war, he experienced years of abuse and neglect in his childhood. According to Laura, Ananda's mother sent him away at age five to live with Hari Krishna's. In a rare recording, Ananda talks to an author about his experiences at Hare Krishna temples. Um, did you ever have your ear twisted or bent as a disciplinary thing? Ripped back. Like cold? Did they ever My neck like... choked so hard with my beads that it cut into my neck. That's yeah. what that scar is from. Nori Mooster is the author who interviewed Ananda and included some of his accounts in her book, Betrayal of the Spirit, a book that discloses the hidden abuse that went on at some of the Hare Krishna temples. They used to do this thing to where you, they would call it dog week. Dog week? And the thing that you had to do is for your punishment, you had to walk around on your hands and knees like a dog. Um, if they spoke to you, you couldn't speak in return, you'd have to bark back. Dr. Andrew Schwartz, who earned his PhD in child experimental studies, listened to the recordings. I'm really surprised he got through this because he was humiliated at almost any turn to literally behave like a dog and without any dignity. He was told to obey blindly. To your knowledge, did your parents ever try to make any attempt to get you out? My mom made a lot of attempts, a lot. How come she couldn't get you for five years? Because Shruta Shrava went into her room at four in the morning stuck a 38 in her mouth and took my brother and sister from her and said that if she didn't keep her mouth shut, that it was going to be her brains on the wall. You can see that this man has had to live with terror from an early age. Ananda ended up at a temple in Denver in his early teenage years. Police got him out of the organization and placed him in foster care for the rest of high school. After that, he joined the army. He'd say, gosh, I'm like one of the few guys that have been through what I've been through, and I'm, I'm still alive. I haven't driven a car into a wall, and I haven't killed myself. About 20 years later, McClure did kill himself, leaving his loved ones behind. Chris has started to come to terms with his dad's death. I thought it was sort of selfish to do, but now I sort of like realize that he was probably in lots of pain. Chris, his mom, and Melissa say they are finding strength from the situation and are trying to move forward. So I, I know that we'll be okay. There are going to be positive things that are going to come from this. We're all stronger for it. My husband, on the other hand, was quite open about his experiences in the war in Iraq. Laura has healed to a point that she's comfortable speaking out about Ananda's death. She now tells his story to audiences such as this one at Linwood High School. If there is any silver lining in my husband's passing, it is that he has made me an advocate. I know he is glad that I am speaking out about his death and not glazing over the details. My husband was a proud soldier. In many ways, the military was his family, however, a dysfunctional one. We need to work together to bring our soldiers home safely and soon. But most importantly, we must make sure that they feel connected and appreciated by our society once they are back. Thank you very much.